Hello, I'm Paul Quigley. I teach in the history department and I'm also a director of the Virginia Center for Civil War Studies. I'm standing right now outside Solitude, the oldest building on our campus. And it's really the perfect place to tell you about a project I've been working on for the last couple of years with a group of people from across campus. We call ourselves the Visualizing Virginia Tech History Team. And in a nutshell, what we're trying to do is to help people see the university's past in new kinds of ways. We use creative technologies to uncover hidden histories and to tell new stories. We come from all over campus, of course, the history department, but also computer science, education, visual arts, the libraries and, and other units as well. And it's a real collaboration across the disciplines, but also between faculty and students. There are a few core faculty members involved uh, most of us affiliated with the Center for Human Computer Interaction. There's me, Doug Bowman, David Hicks, Todd Ogle, Jessica Taylor, and Thomas Tucker. So we're the core faculty, but we depend heavily, and I really mean heavily, on our student collaborators. So far, we've worked with around 20 students, and that number is continuing to rise. So as we're telling new stories about Virginia Tech's past, the way we work models, I think, the best of Virginia Tech's present day educational system. There's a real emphasis on experiential transdisciplinary learning. Since 2018, we've been working under the auspices of the Council on Virginia Tech History, which was formed by President Sands to prepare for the Virginia Tech sesquicentennial in 2022. And President Sands explicitly charged the council with telling new, more inclusive, really more complete stories about the university's history. We're talking about stories that take into account divisions, inequities, and hardships, as well as all of those feel-good moments that we often dwell upon. So we saw a real opening here. What could we achieve if we brought together that quest for hidden histories with the rapidly evolving capabilities of creative technologies? I'm talking about technologies like virtual reality, augmented reality, projection mapping. So bringing those two together is what we're all about. And all of our work really stems from a simple question. If this place could talk, what would it tell us? And we have different project strands. We're uh, doing this in different parts of campus with different topics, different techniques, but that's our underlying question. The centerpiece of everything we've done so far is a projection mapping exhibit that provides an immersive multimedia overview of Virginia Tech history. So let's hear a little more about that project. Hello, my name is Taylor Carroll. I currently work as the motion graphics artist on the VT150 project. While I was a student at Virginia Tech, I got the opportunity to work on the project as a motion graphics artist as well as a graphic designer. I've since graduated and started my own company where I do motion graphics and illustrations for all sorts of clients. And I'm super excited to be able to continue to work on this project as an alumni. My main focus on the project is working on the projection mapping video for the 150th anniversary of Virginia Tech. We are trying to encompass as much as we can about the history of Virginia Tech in about 10 minutes while using a projection on a map as well as videos and animations that bring the history of Virginia Tech to life. I also work on filming, animating, and editing 360 video versions of our VR and AR tours for accessibility, especially with the way times are now, not everyone can get out to the site and it's not as feasible to share headsets. So what I do is I create um, versions of those tours in 360 videos so that people can still access them from their phone or their desktop computer. Virginia Tech, a global land-grant university stretching from Virginia to Switzerland and beyond. But for most Hokies, home is our main campus in Blacksburg with its 35,000 students, 
2,600 acres, 213 buildings, and oh yes, those 65,000 screaming fans who pour into Lane Stadium on game day. We are Virginia Tech. We wear orange and maroon, we worship a larger than life turkey, and we are guided by our motto, Up Prosim, that I may serve. It all started with a small Methodist school for boys. The Olin and Preston Institute was founded in the 1850s in Blacksburg, Virginia, a tiny dot on the map. In 1862, the Morrill Act created a new national system of land-grant colleges. The federal government offered each state western land, land taken from indigenous peoples, that would be sold to fund higher education. The catch? These colleges had to emphasize agriculture and the mechanical arts more than the traditional classical and scientific offerings. So we see the projection mapping display as a kind of foundational and introductory experience. Visitors can come see it, get that overview of the development of campus, learn a little bit about some of the hidden histories themes we're really interested in, and then they can go off and explore more specific topics in digital exhibits, augmented reality tours, and other kinds of experiences as well. And one of those tours takes place right here at Solitude. It's a headset-based augmented reality tour. It brings to life the many layers of history that have shaped this place. So we begin with pre-contact indigenous history. We go through the antebellum era when this land was occupied and worked by dozens of enslaved people. Through to the purchase of the house and the land by the brand new Virginia Agricultural and Mechanical College in 1872. And then going forward from there, we look at 150 years of different uses to which the university has put this building and these grounds. So here's a little preview of what you'll see on the tour. Hi, my name is Nicholas Kukowski and I'm a master's student in computer science. I've been working on the Solitude AR tour for around a year and a half now. And what's been most exciting for me is not just the chance to make something, but figuring out the best way to do it. Since the use of head-worn AR for historical tours is pretty new, uh, there isn't really a lot to go on. So it's experimenting and figuring things out as we go. Welcome to Solitude, the oldest building owned by Virginia Tech on the Blacksburg campus and what we usually call the home place of Virginia Tech. This augmented reality tour brings to life uncovering the hidden histories of the people who lived and work here. If this place could talk, what would it tell us? And it would tell us a heck of a lot. Button in the middle is the app button. From the menu, you can navigate to any section of the tour. The tour takes you to different stops around the grounds and inside the house, exploring specific themes and time periods. The experience starts right here with an overview of more than 200 years of Solitude's history. It's been a plantation, and it used enslaved labor to run it. Before it became part of the Virginia Agriculture and Mechanical College, the ground you're standing on was part of a plantation with enslaved persons, owned by Robert Taylor Preston, the grandson of William Preston. Now let's turn back around to Solitude. Please move to the next marker and face Solitude. Click the touchpad once there to continue the tour. It was Robert Taylor's Preston who initiated a major expansion of the house in 1851. He remodeled Solitude in the Greek Revival style with columns and a symmetrical facade. It was a statement about wealth and prestige at that time. Earlier renovations in the 1830s included a log wing, which gave the structure its southwest facing front with a stone foundation and a small gabled porch. The 1801 structure was a single room with an interior chimney and a small porch across the northwest section of the house. Please move to be in front of Solitude and face towards the drill field. Click down on the touchpad to continue the tour. It's always, it's always been about the land. 10,000 years of unwritten history in the ground here. All our, your ancestors, my, all of our ancestors are now here together. Can't undo the past, but what we can do is seek justice. And, and, and at the end of the day, that's, that's what it's all about, is, is, is justice. Make sure you're standing on the marker. Move around to match the outline with the actual building. When it's lined up, make sure the cursor is on the image and press down on the touchpad to lock it in place. Welcome to the Fraction Family House. 
Like the main house, this building has a long history of its own. Here's what it looked like in the 1990s, before some pretty serious renovation. Preston, who would go on to serve as a Confederate colonel during the Civil War, claimed ownership of Birdie Free enslaved people in 1860. My name is Kira Mosley Hops. I am a descendant of Thomas Fraction, who was the son of John Fraction, who was enslaved here at the Solitude Plantation. As you visit the house today, I want you to think about not just the work that they did as enslaved individuals, but I want you to think about what type of people they are. If you come back, I will kill you, as stated before. So Thomas and Othello write a letter back to Robert Taylor Preston to say, I am a trained soldier now, and if you make a move, I will have no choice but to defend myself. And they come home. I told you if you come back, I was going to shoot you. He pulls out his pistols. Thomas and Othello pull out their pistols given to them by the Civil War um, infantry. And they have a standoff. They're there, pointing guns at each other. We invite you to learn more about Solitude as a plantation and those enslaved here by exploring more documents from the 1850s for the 1890s, exploring them either by theme or time period. Well, I think the tour of Solitude demonstrates the incredible potential of using technology to explore hidden histories. Augmented, virtual, extended reality is especially well placed, I think, to bring marginalized voices, stories, individuals back where they belong into the center of the story. It gives us more control. We're no longer constrained by the choices of previous generations of archivists, historic preservationists who tended to privilege only one kind of dominant voice. This technology gives us the power to present fairer, more complete and more equitable histories. We're also trying to make sure visitors can access at least some of what we do remotely wherever they are. For example, we're planning to create 360 degree video versions of some of our tours that are available online. We're also experimenting with a site called History Pin that allows users to view historical photos, other kinds of resources from their own computer. And if you go right now to vt150.omeka.net, you can check out our online exhibits. They contain historical images, documents, other kinds of information about a whole range of topics. Solitude is there, but also the women of Virginia Tech, student protest in the age of Vietnam, and also the decidedly mixed experiences of the first generations of black students on campus. And the black student experiences are actually going to be the subject of our next AR tour, which we're designing right now. And next, we're going to hear a little from the history student who's developing the content for that tour. Hi, my name is Kenny Barnes, and I'm a senior majoring in history. This semester, I am helping write the script for an augmented reality tour about black history here at Virginia Tech. And when designing that tour, one of the major considerations is the importance of place in the AR experience and the ability for different technologies to really allow us to transport users to different historical sites virtually. Um, I think one of my favorite uses of technology this semester will be at the Hogue Hall stop, um, named after the couple that housed the first eight Black students to attend Virginia Tech. Um, we will be using 360 imagery to actually transport users to the site of their house virtually. And then through um, just first person video recording, they're going to be able to experience the long walk that these students would have had to make back to campus upwards of four times a day um, as they were not allowed to live on campus. Well, that's just a sample of the kinds of things we've been working on. And we fully expect visitors will enjoy these experiences. They'll find them rewarding. But we also believe our work has broader consequences. Visualizing our past more clearly and more completely gives the whole Virginia Tech community past, present and future a deeper and more honest appreciation of what it is that makes our community so special. So it's, it's about reinforcing pride in our achievements. I think we're good at that here at Virginia Tech, but it's also about understanding and learning from the divisions, the inequity and the oppression that's also shaped the university's development. Along the way, our team has also learned about the benefits of collaboration between different disciplines and between faculty and student groups. We've learned new techniques that leverage the power of creative technologies to research hidden stories and share them in engaging ways with diverse audiences. We've learned about the power of hands-on education. We've experimented with the latest technologies, but we're all, always grounded in the importance of place We've learned the immense value of understanding the deep layers of history that have shaped this land, this institution, and our lives today. So these are lessons we'll be taking with us into the sesquicentennial and beyond. 
our work has inspired a new Team Talk Pathways course called History Lab. It's also given our student collaborators new skills, valuable experiences working in transdisciplinary teams. They presented their work to academic and public audiences, all the while serving the interests of the entire Virginia Tech community. We can't think of a better way to build on the first 150 years of Hokie history and prepare for our shared future. Great, thanks uh, team for that excellent video. You all have done such a nice job to, to bring all those things together and uh, and share with us this morning. Glad that you're here. Um, so we do have a few questions. Uh, coming in uh, for the audience, we welcome your questions uh, at bt um, cat.vt.ed/question. Uh, so we'd love to see more of those. Um, so a quick question from Jesse: um, What are some of the challenges you faced in this work, visual VT history, and how have you addressed them? Uh, well, one that springs immediately to mind would be the challenges of working remotely during the pandemic. Um, and we were lucky in one respect in that we had got a good head of steam going before the pandemic. So we had a lot of kind of research material and projects underway. So we've been able to, you know, obviously meet by Zoom, same as everyone else. And then because um, parts of our work at least have been outdoors, we've been able to keep it going, especially the project at Solitude. Are there others you all want to talk about? Um challenges that that you faced on the project yeah sure uh for me when i first got started um i'm now a master's student but i was still an undergrad at the time and uh for designing the solitude ar tour i hadn't really uh had much experience with uh, AR and VR development so i was sort of learning what's best to do there in general um, so for me, that was part of the challenge there was uh, sort of learning uh, on the supply project, um, but also no one or there hasn't been a lot done in this field, as I discussed in the presentation. So there wasn't also anything really to base it off of. Uh, so it was learning not just how to do to the development, but and also what should I be uh, looking to do in the first place. So uh, it's been a fun challenge there. Great. Thank you. Kenny, you want to add? Yeah, I would say for me, um, being a history student, I think the biggest challenge has just been like learning the technology and what capabilities we actually have with it. Um, the research has been very fun um, and writing the script has been very enjoyable, but just learning what technologies we have available to us and how we can actually use them to enhance the user experience, like Nick said, has probably been a challenge, but a very fun one. Mm -hmm. Great. Taylor? Um, my challenge has always been having the dual screens. So we have the top video, which is kind of more of like a graphic aid and then the map. And as you saw, Thomas, it's a it's a giant jigsaw of a map. So there's a lot of uh, back and forth where I have to design it, hoping it'll look a certain way. And then we actually have to take it in and like see what it actually does and make tweaks from there. Great. Thank you. Um, so uh, one question that came up is, uh, and this one's from David, but we wondered how the headsets did in the rain. Yeah, so uh, the headset was um, actually pretty fine in the rain. Um, we didn't have too many issues in terms of uh, all of a sudden, you know, the headset's dead. Um, but the real issues then came with, uh, since it shows the real world through those cameras, um, we would get some distortion looking at the real world. So it was constantly like wiping off every few seconds, you know, trying to keep a clear image there. Do we need some windshield wipers for them? Yes. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so this is a question from Carrie. Um, we still live in the digital divide and the pandemic has shown how many areas near us have, don't have internet access or have, they have spotty access. Some people can't afford the digital devices that allow the tuning in. Um, how, how does your project um, work toward accessibility for populations that don't have access? 
Yeah, this is a really important question to us. And one of the things we're trying to do is make the results of our work as widely accessible as possible. Um, so at the Solitude project, we actually began with the in-person experience and now we're kind of spreading outward into a, a 360 degree video experience that will be available. But of course you need good, good internet to experience that from home. Um, so I'd say our approach to that is to try and make it as accessible in different kinds of ways as possible. So we will hopefully be able to offer an in-person experience for groups who want to come and tour solitude at some point, as well as the at home version. So again, just trying to make it as broadly accessible as possible. I don't know, Nick, any of the others may have other thoughts on that question. Yeah, obviously for the AR tour, if you do that in person, uh, that headset is obviously a very, you know, specialized piece of equipment, but we also have a lot of them. Um, so that uh, once it is more publicly available, it's not that you need to bring your own headset. We will provide one to you. So uh, that's part of addressing that. Great. Um, let's see. I'm looking at the questions here. We've got some really good ones. Um, Kathy says she just wants to say thank you and she's enjoying the visualizing the history. Um, how and when would this technology be available to create for historical sites for, for nonprofit facilities that are not staffed but have so much history to share? Yeah, we honestly haven't given much thought to life outside of this Virginia Tech History Project yet, but it is an obvious question to ask because especially, you know, the work that uh, Nick, for example, has been doing, he, as he mentioned, has created something new here. So it is something that we uh, would imagine will be of interest to other historical sites in the future. We don't have a process worked out where we'll offer that. I would imagine we'll write up the results of our research and make that available uh, publicly in the future. But yeah, that's a good question. Any, any thoughts from the others on that? I think that can tie back into accessibility as well. So while building out the AR tour um, and then having the headsets is one thing, we are like Paul mentioned working in 360 video. So that is equipment, but that's like, you can rent a headset, but you can also rent a 360 video. And that's something that we, that um, you could record the site and recreate, which is what we're doing, recreating the experience in a 360 space that you can use on your camera, um, like on your phone or on your computer. Great. Um, Taylor, we actually have a couple of questions for you. Um, some folks are really interested in your, your um, starting your own company um, and would like to know if you have um, advice for students who are about careers uh, on their education. Starting their oh. own business. <laughs> um, so the main advice I would give is honestly like really cliche, like just do it. Um, so I, when I graduated, I got into a graphic design job, which was super awesome, but I knew that there's more I wanted to do in this field, like of like motion graphics and working with technology. So all I did is research how to get an LLC. And then I, I just figured it out from there. I'm still figuring out from there. Um, I'm, I'm more worried about tax season than anything, but we're going forward with it. And, um, just just relying on your connections and seeing like where you can go because you you don't know until you ask sure great thank you taylor and that those questions there were several of those so um uh brandon and jessica asked about that um let's see kurt says this is a super exciting project uh can you say more about the historical research so this is for kenny uh, that you're building on to create these experiences. Is this research conducted by VT faculty and students, museums, local historians? Where, are you, where does that information come from? Um, a lot of the information um, is coming from the Virginia Tech Special Collections. So probably since 2000, they've really done a great job of collecting um, a bunch of different artifacts, um, photos, documents from Black history at Virginia Tech um, and oral history. So most of the information is coming from there. Um, it's really just a matter of compiling it and making it a way that is presentable to an audience that will be engaged with it and learn from it. Great. Thank you. Um, how, this one's from Melissa, how do you pull students 
through working on a project like this, or if a student is watching involved in this kind of, what should they be doing? Uh, yeah, they, they would be more than welcome to email me. It's pquigley at bt.edu. Uh, we're always looking for student collaborators. And along the way, we have uh, gotten in touch with our student collaborators collaborators in a variety of ways. Probably the typical one is one of the core faculty members on the team has taught a student in a class and, you know, they get to learn about the project and get involved that way. Um, but then we also have recruited some students through one of our collaborators is Todd Ogle, who runs the ARIES program in the university libraries. Um, so he has um, in any given semester you know, a number of students working for him in various capacities. And so some of them get involved with the project. So mostly via the faculty team members, we've gotten, you know, a whole range of students involved, but we're always looking for more. Excellent. And faculty can be, can be involved as well. I, I understand yeah. Dave is part of this, is David Hicks part of this team as well? Yes. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, we're, we're uh, already a big group, but we, you know, we've definitely got room for more members. And I would also add the other way that some students have gotten involved is through independent studies. Um, so often, you know, sometimes they're already involved in some way with the project. And then there's a piece of it that they're especially interested in, like Kenny's work this semester, for example, is an independent study. So he's doing it for academic credit, but it will also uh, result in this publicly available, really cool experience. So that's another option too. Great. Well, we are at time. So I wanna thank our team so much. Um, Nicholas and Taylor, Kenny and Paul, you all did such a great job. Thanks for all your work to pull this together. Um, and thanks audience for all your questions. This was great this morning. Um, we'll be back next week uh, talking about the Lane Hall projections. Our own George Hardebeck um, is working on some very cool things uh, also related to the sesquicentennial and also in, in Virginia Tech's history. So we'll look forward to that next week. Uh, so thanks everybody and we'll see you next time. <laughs>